Would you like to grow your roofing company into a multi-million dollar eight-figure roofing business? Well, let's talk about your expectations. You're going to love this episode. Hey guys, welcome to the Roofing Business Builder Podcast. I'm Daniel Laxons, your host, and I'm a 30-year vet in the commercial roofing industry, and I am your personal commercial roofing guru. Now today we're going to be talking about expectations with my special guest, Brian McSteen. Now he owns a, a roofing business, and he also owns a roofing supply company. But before we get into in that interview with Brian McSteen, I'm going to go over our intention. The intention for this episode is I empower all. I empower all. Now, when I'm saying all, I'm talking about your family, your friends, and your employees. We want to empower people around us. Sometimes we think, well, if I give this task to someone else, they won't do it exactly the way I would do it. And guess what? They never will. It's, in, they're, it's impossible. They're incapable of doing things exactly the way you would do it. But isn't it important, though, to free up our time? As entrepreneurs, we need to gain more time for ourselves. So who cares if it's not exactly the way we'd want it? However, if we give them an expectation of what we want, then they're going to do it within their personality, within their abilities, and it gets done. And it's fine. It's perfect. So be sure to empower all and use this intention this week. Tell yourself, I'm going to empower everyone around me. All right. So now let's get started with this interview. In this episode, I interview Brian McSteen. Uh, he is the co-founder of McAllen Valley Roofing, and he's also a co-founder in Budget Roofing Supply. And he also has a badass Porsche. Now, in this interview, we discuss many of the factors that go into play when you're scaling your roofing business into the multi-million dollar range. Now, his company, McAllen Valley Roofing, is already an eight-figure company. And he also owns Budget Roofing Supply, uh, which is another amazing thing to get into but the the experience he's gained over the years has really helped him to learn what works when scaling that business and how to set an expectation with your employees so we talk about a lot of different things and what's really neat is in this episode uh, brian joins me in my private nightclub at my house in new Braunfels. so let's look into my interview with Brian McSteen. Brian, so glad that you're on the show. How's it going? It's going really great. Uh, things are going really well. Uh, business is good, and uh, I'm happy to be here to kind of, you know, share some of my knowledge and kind of some of the things that are going on in the industry with you. So the roofers that listen to the podcast and uh, watch this on YouTube, they they want to better themselves. They want to better their business. They want to learn more, do the right things, and and that's what we're trying to do is to help roofers to to really not have, give that the roofing industry a name like some of the other roofers have done so if we can keep educating and uh, you've been educating roofers you even designed a new program recently yeah I think you know everyone's always trying to you know make their company better uh, they're always trying to improve themselves uh, they're always trying to learn uh, things and kind of implement and you know add you know additional uh, ways of you know making revenue to their companies, uh, so that's you know something that we've been teaching, uh, and, and something that we've been doing for some time, and and that's kind of what we're gonna you know share with uh, everybody today. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about ways of uh, helping to educate your employees in a, in a systematic way, Correct. and we're also gonna get a little feel on what the roofing industry, the supply chain, how, how that is going. Uh, Brian McSteen not only has, uh, he's a co-founder with McAllen Valley Roofing, but he's also a co-founder of Budget Roofing Supplies. That's and correct. and so, uh, so we can get a lot of good information. But uh, to get into this, the, one of the first questions I ask people is, how did you get into the roofing industry? <laughs> uh, this is actually a funny story. Um, so, I was in high school, it was my freshman year, 
and I had a teacher talking down to me and the I didn't like the way that the teacher was speaking to me and so uh, you know the teacher was like hey don't talk back and you know back to me like that I'm like well if you you know if you want respect you know from somebody you need to give it I don't care how old you are and he's like you're not gonna talk to me like that you're a child I'm an adult and you know they they had this you know mindset that regardless of your age you know there's a boundary of respect and I just didn't I didn't carry that belief with me even when I was younger and uh, I went to the principal's office and the principal uh, was like well, what happened <laughs> like he was being rude and he was being disrespectful and I you know, I'm not just going to, I'm not going to stand for that. And he said, you know what, uh, you seem like, you know, you're a good kid. Uh, you seem like you really have a good head on your shoulders. And so, you know, I was <laughs> sitting in the principal's office and he hands me this flyer that says, best job ever, base pay, $10 an hour starting plus commissions. <laughs> and I was like, that sounds great. Best job ever. It must be, so there must be something exciting about it. Uh, in, in commission, that's great. So I'm not just going to have, you know, there's going to be no glass ceiling for me. I'm going to be able to, you know, get something where it brings me security, uh, but also make a little extra money so, you know, I can do whatever I want with it, just like I always have, you know, because when I was 12 is when I first started my own lawn mowing business. You know, I did, uh, I'd mowed lawns, uh, I'd had shoveled driveways. Uh, I was a paper boy, so I was always, you know, intrinsically motivated. I, I just had it in me. I wanted, I always wanted more. I mean, when I was, you know, 15, I bought my own, you know, electric toothbrush. And, uh, I mean, I, I was a... They had those back then? Yeah. <laughs> I named awesome. them by cuspid. I had them for 26 <laughs> years. I just changed the head on the top of them. and They're Oral-B. It was the first one that they had come out with. Wow. Yeah. It's like, I, we still have a Mac, uh, uh, one of the small Mac things that it's like older than dirt. Yeah, people would be like... Shit I, that was made back then still works. Yeah, unbelievable. So I, I worked really hard. You know, I took care of myself as, you know, as a young entrepreneur. And I, and I took that same energy and, you know, that, that motivation from the sports I had played and just the way that I just grew up just in general. I mean, my mom wasn't always around. She was always out working. So I saw that she was working hard for the family. And, uh, you know, to growing up and seeing that, I'm like, well, I might as well do the same thing and just work hard for what I want. And I just, I was always, you know, I was always trying to be the best. I was always trying to win. Uh, and I was always trying to get ahead. So it's incredible. So, yeah. you know, what, what I found over the years is that most roofers come through the family. It, it's passed down from yeah. great grandfather, to grandfather to, you know, father to son. Yeah. And most, and most it, people, yeah. And most people think, oh, you, you're, is this your family business? Did you, did you get money from your family? I got nothing from my family. <laughs> I, no offense, mom, <laughs> but mom, you didn't start me in the roofing industry. You're the one that told me get a normal job. So yeah, yeah. I was, always, I, was the same, I was the same way. My, my dad yeah. saw me struggling, just poor as can be. He said, "I think I'd be more proud if you worked at McDonald's for sixty to eighty hours a week." You, why don't you just go to Jewel and pack bags? Yeah. And yeah. Like, I'll, I can't do hard it. Hard pass. No hard pass. Hard pass. But and it was a flyer, though. It was a flyer. Uh, That's incredible. In the principal's office, they dropped flyers off the local high school. I was a freshman. This is in two thousand one. You know, this is twenty years ago. And I went and applied, and it was for door knocking. It was for being a canvasser. Wow. It was a company called National Energy uh, in Lombard, Illinois. And I went there and applied, and they had a canvassing team of like 15 to 20 guys. And this is a siding and a window company. And I'm like, wow, this is really amazing. And it seemed normal to me then because I didn't know any better. I've never seen this type of organization, but they sold windows, they sold siding, and then eventually they sold roofing. Uh, and they had a canvassing team. And in 20 minutes, every day before we'd go out, they train us. Wow. They, would, they would do scripting, teach us about the different products, how to knock a door. They would give us the territories that we needed to go. They would say, this is what I expect of you. And when you come back, these are the amount of leads that I expect of you. And so they held us accountable, made me feel like I can't go back to the office unless I've produced something and actually done what I was supposed to do. And I think that little extra push on top of my internal you know, motivation is really what helped me succeed. And I, I figured, you know, I ended up finding out that that was, that was for me. 
that actually it actually worked really well for me and I was very successful at it that's incredible yeah and then from there though you uh, from that company when did you start the first so business in well so that kind of goes into the next story my family they owned a telemarketing company at the time and they were actually making phone calls for another roofing company called Elite Exterior Restorations, which they're not in business anymore, so I can say their name. Uh, and then what ended up happening is they were looking for sales reps, and my mom's like, "Hey, this would probably be perfect for you because you know you you know how to get leads. You're getting leads for other salespeople, but you're not actually selling the jobs." Mm -hmm. And at that time, when I was actually door knocking, I was also doing you know cold calling over the phone. So half of the day, the first part of the day, I would be cold calling, and then the last part of the day you know, I'd be knocking on doors. And so just that lead generation and understanding what it took to create an opportunity gave me the utmost respect for the opportunity and really made me customer centric and pushed me to give the right kind of energy towards that lead because I, I can't lose this lead. I like work so hard. I worked the last two hours just to be able to get this opportunity to run this lead. And so when I had work, when I actually went to go work for that company and got hired, uh, I started door knocking and I sold the first door that I ever knocked on. <laughs> I left a sticky note. I'm in your neighborhood giving free roof inspections. Knocked on the door, left a sticky note, and they called. And the craziest thing was, uh, I came back. I, I set up, I'm like sitting there trying to set up the ladder at their house. It's like a brand new, like old gorilla ladder. And she's like, are you good? The homeowner? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm trying to figure, trying to figure out this ladder. <laughs> I get up on the roof and I find some missing shingles. So I called my boss. I'm like, hey, I just got up on the roof. I don't know what to do. And so he comes over and he helps me and we sign the customer on the spot under a service agreement, contingency agreement. You know, if I get this approved, then we'll work, you know, we'll work with you. Uh, and so, cause you don't want to work for free. No, you don't want to get up there and do all so that. So the free. insurance adjuster ended up coming the next day after they filed the claim and I got it approved. Wow. So the first door that I ever knocked on is the first roof that I ever sold. And it was an insurance job. It was an insurance job and they approved that. That's, <laughs> they gave a, they gave the insurance paperwork on the spot. His name was Steve Kowalski with State Farm, wow. and he gave me the, he gave the check right there on the spot, and I took the check that next day, and I turned it in. I t literally, my second day on the job, I turned in my first project, and I sold my first job, and now at that point, I was like, yeah! This is amazing! I'm making money! And, I, and then I had realized that it was possible. Um, and good money. I mean, this is the American was, dream. I mean, back then it was, yeah, it is. The blue collar uh, American dream, it is. I mean, it was, I think it was like a $9,000 job at that time. Uh, you know, this is, you know, back in 2003, I believe that was. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so cool. Yeah, yeah, really cool. And then from there, how did, how did the first, and what was the first? So that's what motivated me. That's what kept me in it. That's what fired and sparked the interest. And I was like, yeah, I can do this. Like I can actually do this, and that, it's not that, hard. And that adjuster ended up giving me uh, 22 projects. So you created a relationship yes. with the adjuster, with the insurance adjuster. I didn't. Did you ever take him out for beers or anything? No, no. Just, we just. I think he just liked that I was honest. Uh, he he liked the fact that I didn't supplement the jobs. <laughs> he just wrote a really good estimate. I left it alone. We'd finished the job, and I did invoice. Wow. Close out the file. And that's what he liked. So you were also a say do person. Say do meaning that you did what you said, and he recognized that in you. That's correct. That you're responsible. I can work with this guy. Send him all of my work because he's he's going to do what he says he's going to do. Yeah, yeah. And and I got you know rewarded uh, handsomely for it. So yeah. And it worked out really really well. And I ended up being the top salesman for that company at that my first year in business. Wow. And I made over a hundred thousand dollars my first year in business. So, uh, so after that though, when did, when so did what's, I, the, what's I, the first company that you, so the first, company? the first company that I had officially owned with out of, you know, on, on paper. Okay. Cause you know, you go throughout life and you make these handshake agreements, but on paper, uh, is McCallum Valley roofing. So from, from Chicago, when was the first, uh, roofing company? When it, what made you get to a point where you said, that's it. 
I'm starting my own ripping business and you partnered up with someone. I had worked for Elite Exterior Restorations and then what ended up happening is uh, I made them so much money that these guys, one of the business owners went off the deep end. Mm. He, one of the, the other guy bought a brand new Ferrari, but then I didn't make, pay me my commissions. That's what happens. What happens? That's what happens. <laughs> I, I, I know so many riffers. You know, I've had over 120 riff, roofing customers. And of course I was a roofer for 15 years, own family business that I took over. But the same thing happened to me where, where they, they made, you know, like $300,000 on a project and they thought, damn, I've never had this kind of money. And they think that they could go out and buy something super expensive or yeah. a house or whatever. Other people that yeah. maybe sold a million dollar job thinks that they're ready for a, a private jet. Right. You're, you're not ready for the private jet, no. So it, I'm, it was, I'm after the, I don't know about him, but I'm after that G8 money, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna get it someday, I promise. Yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah, baby. Yeah. But so, but but that's the point, though. It, that, that's another good lesson for a lot of people to, to know is is uh, it feels like a lot of money, but it really isn't. Even a million dollars is not a lot of money. It is, but it's not. So don't spend it. Build your company with the money. You know, it, it, a good rule of thumb is take seventy percent and keep rolling it until you have a million dollars in the bank. Very important because if you're going to do a larger job and you have to have a bond, you, if you have never been, you become the bank. Yeah, you have. And, to, and, yeah. and if you want to become, you know, you want to have those type of projects, and you need to be able to front the labor, you need to be able to front that material at, you know, depending on you know what your your cycle is, uh, as far as you know what, what you have agreed with the customer, uh, but you have to front that labor, mm -hmm. and you have to pay your laborers right away. And if you don't have that money, you're you're in trouble. Yeah. So. so build that money and then also yeah, uh, yeah. hire well, because, you know, if you have money, you can finally hire people. Um, you know, it, it, they, they go to say, is, you know, hiring, I can't find the right people and I, I can't, I, I don't know where to go to find the right people. It's well, how about you create a training program or a training system or set the expectations? The problem, the problem we, we do as business owners is we, we have this big facade and we think, oh, he's a roofer. He knows ex exactly what he's supposed to do. He knows what a kickout flashing is, apron flashing is, counter flashing. He knows how to install ice and water shield. He knows how to do felt. He knows how to do drip edge. But if you go to any average roofer and you ask him, hey, on the rakes or on the eaves, does the under underlayment go under or over? And he'll, and he'll sit there with a blank stare on his face and he won't have any clue. I mean, how many times have you seen a person install ice and water shield over felt? <laughs> and, and the thing is, is we're, we're hiring those people but the problem is, is we have the assumption they know what they're, they're doing. Because uh, what, what I found is that most people learn from someone that taught them on their previous roofing job. And then they think that they're a roofer. But the thing is, a lot of companies that get started were started by people that were working for a company that was started by a person that was working for another company. But each of those people never learned yeah. exactly how. Because yeah. I had these roofers that were working for me, subcontractors, and they says, well, how do you want it done? I go, the instructions are on every bundle of shingles. I flipped yeah, but that's over. the installation instructions. Well, I know, but they, they weren't, they weren't uh, spacing the nails. They weren't, there's a lot of things that they were missing in their training, right. but they just didn't know. It wasn't that they were bad people, they were just ignorant. And, and that's what you're doing is you're, you designed a video, you're designing videotapes to teach your, your, that's your, correct. your new hires. There, there's, there's four ways to learn. Either you see someone do it, you hear about someone doing it, you read it about someone that did it, or you do it. And doing it is the most efficient way of learning something. And so we, we've created you know, a training platform okay, and a program that walks them through our expectations my expectations are higher than probably anybody's in the country. And I've defined those expectations and I'm transferring those expectations to who I'm working with. We cannot walk around assuming that we know that people, you know, <laughs> they, or think that they, they know or they should act or be the same way that we expect them to be. And we're always going to be in the same vicious cycle of getting, getting disappointed and getting mad at our crews for something that we think they should know they actually don't and they don't understand why we're mad at them.
Mm -hmm. And that's what we found too, is that, you know, the, the owner knows, uh, but when it comes to some of the foremen, maybe the foreman has certain things that they may like to do different than what the owner wants. And we want, we want that foreman to be the owner uh, while they're on the job to make sure it's done exactly the way the owner wants it done. And, and sometimes that foreman maybe learned from the owner, but then all of a sudden they forgot a few things. And that's the reason why the video SOPs or those video standard operating procedures that you're designed that you've designed correct are, and that's what I, I'm always preaching within the, the Ripping and Business it, Builder it, course too. And, and the thing is is the my my program that I've built, it doesn't just break down, you know, step by step, this is what you're supposed to do. It breaks down the tools required. Ooh, that's good. Okay, so what are the tools that I require of you? What do I require for you to have on site? How do I require you to have it on site? Uh, for instance, the AC. What do you put over the AC? What's your expectation of what do they put over the AC? How do you protect it? If you don't communicate how they're supposed to protect it and it falls down and you charge back that crew, that's really your fault because you didn't tell them your expectations. They might not know any better. So it's, it's our job as business owners to set the expectations with everybody that we're working with. And that's one of the, it's probably a book I'll end up writing in the future is what our, what our expectations are I and how to, to, how to set those expectations with everybody around you and how to get them to follow the expectations and get them to where you want them to be, to be above uh, status quo. That's beautiful. You mean uh, you have to protect the air conditioning units? <laughs> <laughs> or the garage door. I mean, how many jobs, you know, for the roofers out there, I mean, how many jobs you go and there's tar marks on the side of the house. Okay. When it could have just been simply protected by the eight sheets of plywood that I require my crew to have on job sites to protect the windows. Not just to mention, I require tow boards to be around the entire perimeter when they're tearing off so material does not hit the ground. They pick it up and they carry it to the trash. Those are expectations you should have. Those are expectations you're not setting. Yeah, that, that was what we always did with uh, my previous uh, Clear Blue Skies. We would, yeah. we would uh, make sure, I, I told them, not one nail from that roof will hit the ground. Yeah, Everything nails goes, are going to hit the ground. I know, I know, the ground. No, I know but, but I had an expectation held out from I know that something's going to happen. <laughs> but, but the thing is, but the point is, is I had crews one time and I told them that expectation. They didn't remember it. They went back never to Never make old, a joke out of an expectation yeah. because it won't take you seriously. It's not a joke. It's not yeah, a joke. Yeah, but a nail. No, I never had a nail hit the ground. Gotcha. Yeah, Once I mean, in a while. No, it's, I'm, it's, but I'm saying. It's, it, unaccept, it's unacceptable for someone to, you for a customer to walk up to their house during a construction site, in my eyes. And have to worry about stepping on a nail or stepping over trash or, or lawnmower grab it and throw it and hit some kid on a bicycle or something that's correct yeah so but what we did is we laid out tarps so whenever we're doing the tear off i i every section that they're working i had them tarp it off underneath so that way no nail would hit the ground so i really did i really yeah. did uh we did a really good so job. we have a so for instance in one of the tools we require that they have a minimum of five tarps with a specific size we have a minimum of eight sheets of plywood a minimum of four tear-off bars. When they tear off the roof, they tear off the whole roof together. They all tear off an elevation at the exact same time. Then they all go and actually do the underlayment at the exact same time. Make sure it's dried in. Everything's completely clean around the house. But how are they going to know that? How are you going to get more business and improve your company if you don't set the expectations that your client, that your client wants? It's not about what we want, it's what our client expects of us, being customer centric. When they play this picture in their head of the, your amazing roofing company and then some crew comes out with some piece of truck and somebody else's magnets and no shirts and baggy clothes playing music and they look like they don't know what they're doing and they're throwing trash around the house, does that really represent your roofing company? Mm-hmm. It doesn't. No. And so they're, they're sitting here like, I paid for this? I had, a, I had a crew one time. I came by to check on the job. And it was a really nice house. Two of the guys were in a swimming pool. <laughs> That's actually <laughs> happened to my job. I've had it where they had a pier and they were fishing. They were fishing on my customer's pier. Wow. Yeah. That's just, <laughs> it, that's what I'm They've saying. They've literally been in the pool, peeing on the side of the house. I mean, just... Just the most ridiculous, ridiculous things. And you know that, that really comes from the top. And we blame the crew, 
but we should blame ourselves. Yeah. Set the expectations. And it's extremely Beat yourself up a little bit, but then take that as a lesson and then improve it. You know, don't, you know, because I, a lot of people will be like, oh, you know, but I, I'm always teaching also the mindset. The first part of what we teach with Roofing Business Builder is you have to have the mindset. And, uh, that's right. But the thing is, is I love what you're, you're teaching here because it means a lot. And once your employees hear this from you, they, they feel confident. It's kind of like a, you can see a, a child that you're raising. If, if, uh, if you have, um, if you explain the rules or the expectation, what you're saying, then that child is actually, it's a lot easier for him and they have, has confidence and your employees will have confidence uh, because you're not reacting in the angry way and yelling and, the, and they'll say, hey, I got this expectation, the client expects this, I promise this to the client. And so we, we want to be a company people, that actually do what we yeah. say. People want to know what their expectations are. People want to know that they got, did a good job when it's done. They want to feel appreciated that they actually and, and be rewarded uh, for that, not just financially, but with your words. Yeah, so. people want to feel, want everyone to know that they have value. Exactly. Yes. And so you got to say, this is, you know, this is what we're, this is how our organization is going to get to the next level. Because I'll tell you, you can't run a 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50, or $100 million roofing company if you don't set those expectations uh, with, you know, with your crews and your employees. And it creates loyalty. So, I mean, for example, and you're a perfect testament to this, I mean, how many employees have actually left you and then came back later on? You know... We, we actually have a lot of people, like they say, grass is not greener on the other side. Sometimes they think it is. You know, as far as my company, I've created so much value because I teach how to get business to chase you rather than you to chase it. And I've changed the entire dynamic of a biz, of the roofing company where, you know, usually the, the owner actually relies on the salesman uh, to produce revenue and, and sales and leads uh, for the company. Well, what I do is I provide leads and they rely on me to give them what they need. And so it completely changes that dynamic and puts you in the power seat where you can actually take control of your business. That's so cool. Yeah. So that is incredible. And uh, so, th you know, is when you get business to chase you, that's when you create something truly sustainable. You know, you're supposed to, you know, advertise, like a local, be out there, be in the community, you know, philanthropy, whatever you have to do to be part of your community, be part of the chambers of commerce, but also chase like a stormer. Pound the doors and, uh, and put yourself out there because attention, that's how you get business. Nobody, nobody gets business without attention. So the more attention that you get, you look at movie stars, the more money you make. The bigger the problems you solve, the more money you make. You do with little problems, you make little money. You deal with big problems like commercial, you make big money. You gotta think about that when, you're, when you go into your, you know, your business plan. What is it that you want to accomplish because all goals are actually accomplished backwards. Figure out, okay, this is what I want. A goal is a math equation, right? So some people just have small goals, whether it's two million. Some people have big goals, but what they don't realize is they can actually accomplish those goals just by breaking down you know, at a, at a micro level, what is it going to take to get there? How many leads do I need? I know to hit my goal, I need 6,000 leads a year. So what am I focused on? The marketing that's going to generate enough leads to get me there based on my current closing ratio. I know if I get 6,000 leads and I close 20%, I will hit my goal based on my average amount of sale. And that reduces a lot of stress. To do it that way, it does. So it's reverse engineering uh, the uh, the target, the, the 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 main goal that you want. And there's little That's goals it. along the way. See, most people they just run forward. I want to hit six million, but they don't know what it takes to get there. Mm -hmm. They don't break it down. It is literally a math equation. If I want to hit a hundred million, I could. I'd be like, okay, I need two recruiters. Uh, I have this much time. I need this many salespeople. This many salespeople. This many leads. Uh, I know if I can't produce you know, more than 6,000 leads, I know that they're gonna have to supplement that. So, and then I break down, okay, how many leads do I need each person to get? 
What's my closing ratio on those leads? And you actually can break it down. You can break down a hundred million dollars if you want. It's mm -hmm. just what it is that you I like want. the way he thinks guys. Reverse engineer it and then say, this is how many leads. This is my closing ratio. Hire and train, hire and train, hire and train and fire what doesn't work and you'll get there. That's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. All right. So now let's talk about uh, the state of the roofing supplies in the industry. <laughs> so, so I mean, yeah, you, you own, uh, you're one of the owners of budget roofing, budget roofing supply supply. Yeah. And so the, yeah, budget roofing supply. So they, they, uh, they purchase large amounts of residential and commercial yeah. roofing. So we, we know that I, I've heard, uh, you know, one of the ISO companies that I'm still very really close with, uh, some of the big people up there, uh, said that they're like six months behind. I hear several TPO yeah. manufacturers are six months behind. Yes, and so there's a big shift happening right now, okay? Uh, and so e evolve or dissolve. And, you know, part of evolving is you, know, you have to move with what's happening in the market sometimes. Sometimes you don't fight it, you flow with it. Okay, but you have to foresee what's going to happen to the market. I, you know, if TPO, if you can't get TPO for a metal building, what's the first thing you think of? Coatings. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen? I, I'm going to go and I'm going to predict and I'm going to go buy as much coatings I can because before there's a shortage in that, I want to make sure I have enough to sell it. And so, and, and there is no, I mean, I haven't seen shortages in coatings. That's there has really not been any shortages area. in coatings at all. Uh, as but a, now here's the thing is, yet. what I always teach too is uh, something dangerous though. So some people watching this might say, well, boom, that's it. Uh, we're just going to um, switch everything to coatings, which you can do, but just be careful because again, you can lose the skill set of some of your people or there's going to be a learning curve. How long does it take to really train? Say if you already have a crew that does built up or does uh, so, single so ply here's, here's to little, train them to do coding. So here's, here's a little secret. Okay. I hire framers and painters. Yes. Because they are articulate. They are detail oriented. Okay. And you hand a spray gun to a roofer, that's usually with a nail gun, and the next thing you'll be doing is hiring an entire wa car wash crew <laughs> to go buff and clean an entire parking lot of cars. Yes, that's so cool. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> and so the, it, basically a spray rig okay, is just essentially a, a large you know, paint sprayer. Mm -hmm. And so we hire professional painters, make them our employees. And it, and it becomes natural to them. It's just a little bit larger of a hose and just a little bit larger of a gun. And it's exactly what they've been doing their entire life. They understand masking. They understand coverage, overlap, et cetera, et cetera. They understand so, runs. <laughs> yeah. And, and so don't hire roofers to do your coatings. Hire professional painters. Go to PP&G. Go to Sherman Williams and ask who's your best painter and put them on your staff. That's amazing. And by the way, sorry about that. Um, pain, painting the supplies. <laughs> yeah. we're, you know, we're not trying to poach your employees, but either way, that's no, it's not their employees. It's the, oh. the, so they have a board, These are the subcontractors. they have the board inside there oh. and people are like, Hey, I'm looking for work. And they pin their business card because oh, they're painters wow. to the board and Sherwin Williams, PP and G they, they, they pin them to the board and then you just go in there, you grab the card. And then you call them and say, hey, I'm looking for a painter to put on my staff. That's a genius tip. And, and, uh, and we've found that's extremely successful. And we've honestly never had a complaint. Um, we hired the best painters we could find. We've never had a complaint for them as far as roof coatings. And, you know, it really comes down to preparation. Someone that's willing to follow, you know, just simple steps. And we found that, you know, painters and framers, framers are just, you know, the best option. So. And what's good about that too is that you're not going to disrupt your uh, business by taking some of your employees that are more skilled towards one product that they're already making you money on yeah. and shipping them over. So even and the thing is because they're articulate, what we do is we actually train them to do other things like TPO, et cetera, et cetera. But as far as the budget roofing supply, you know, because we, there's a little cross pollination, but not really because they're two totally separate companies. 
Um, but it's, it's really amazing to see both sides of the business and on the, the supply business, people don't really see, you know, the, the struggles uh, that, you know, we go through uh, or that I even went through just to be able to get into the, the supply business. You know, there's, there's a lot of politics that goes on with the manufacturers and the, you know, the different distributors, you know, threatening different people saying, hey, you don't buy, you know, don't sell to them or if they get the same price, we're going to have a problem. So, you know, there was definitely some challenges getting into this uh, from the very beginning, but we broke that, through that barrier and uh, we're, we're becoming one of the, the largest distributors in South Texas, which is really, really cool. Congratulations. So, thanks, That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, really cool. And so, you know, yeah. I was thinking too, uh, on the, paint, the painter, hire a painter, yeah. uh, I know that there's one major manufacturer uh, that we both know that maybe because they're, um, they, they custom make the deck sheets, and there's a, there's a couple now that are doing that too, but because they make the deck sheets, wouldn't it be advantageous for a roofer to hire, if, if they're licensed with one of those companies, to hire uh, carpet layers? Because carpet layers know about how to, how to kick out, how to kick things out. That's an idea, you know? Yeah, that's a Go fantastic into a carpet idea. Supply and grab one of the car, you know, grab the carts off of there, call them up. Looking for work, there's an easy I'm place. I'm gonna be doing this on Tuesday. <laughs> This is good. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I know. Yeah. But they would make better because they there won't Where's be Brian? wrinkles. There won't be wrinkles because those those guys know how to kick it in and push it out, make sure everything that's and they're correct. used to doing it and they have used an to eye. Stretching and yeah, yeah, that's right, they do. That's they have, they have an eye for great quality. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> see, this is we collaborate. This is why you collaborate. Ideas unite. And they help everybody. Yeah, masterminds. They, right. Yeah, more minds together, uh, get, you get a lot more accomplished. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, some of the challenges that we've had is getting colors, okay? Um, but the biggest problem really in America right now is, is due to COVID, okay? Or the past COVID, because it's gone now. No, it's, it's, it's due to COVID. Yeah, and but it's, it's due to it. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's due to result. COVID. It's a result of, of you know, COVID and, and some of the policies uh, that the government has actually put into place. Um, so people, and every, I think everybody here you know, can, can side with me here and say that people were getting paid more by sitting home mm -hmm. than going to work. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like food stamps. You give people food stamps and they're like, well, shit, I can sit on the couch and smoke pot and I don't have to do anything, right? So what happened when they cut the food stamps? The unemployment rate went down. And so now all this money is going to these people are sitting at home and these manufacturers, these manufacturers cannot have enough of employees to build the products that they need because of the policies that the government's put in place for people uh, you know, to sit at home and, and get these benefits. And people, there's no benefit for them to go back to work. They need to cut that, get back to work so they can start manufacturing. And it's basically fake inflation. And we have nothing against sitting at home on the couch and having a little smoke, but so you can, <laughs> all y'all out there. You can delete there. that if you want. No, 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 like it. No, they're, they're, we're not judging that. We're just saying that people that are productive are happier people. Uh, people that are, I mean, life is not to be here just sitting on the couch, enjoying ourselves, but that gets bored. Well, no, but, it's, it's but about the, we'll getting get the benefit from the government. No, it's that's and, just and not what's good. happening, and, and that's it's unhealthy. Pull, it's pulling away from the organizations and the companies that need employees, that can't hire employees, that can't produce for the demand. Mm -hmm. The demand is way higher than what they can produce. It causes the prices to go up because no one wants to go to work. And guess what happens? No one can get material. We slow the infrastructure and in being able to build America back again. We can't build the, the roofs back from you know, pre-storm condition. Mm -hmm. And it's causing a huge issue and it's causing the housing market to actually it just skyrocket. No, I felt the same way about the whole, the whole ordeal because reality is, is uh, for every business owner, this America is full of business owners. That's why America was started is we wanted to be able to be our own king. We want to be our own dukes. We want to be able to, to live like a king if you work for it. If you, if, you, if you build it and you help others, 
then that's the American dream. Yeah, absolutely. You and, help and, enough people but, get where they want, you'll get where you want. But when you're told that you're, you have to close, and I mean, I wouldn't mind giving up three months, but when it came to six months, half a, or, or almost a year, boom, it went over a year. That's not, that's not American. And I, I was really upset about that myself because, you know, freedom says that if I want to do business with someone, and and I, that's my business. And if they choose to do business with me, I don't need the government. As long as we're treating everyone fairly, it's like, well, but you're going to get someone sick. I'm not going to a nursing home. I'm not going to be around. But if my customers want to work with me, that's my business. Yeah. You know, I have a healthy immune system. They do too. Yeah. So, anyways, that okay. It's not about that though. It's they're not sick at home. Oh, I know. They're but just that, getting that created. The, it. They're, they, they, they created, created it. it. it created and now it. people are sitting at home. And now you have a house. It takes forty days to get to create a habit, and that's yeah. a bad habit. And now a house costs, you know, seventy percent more than it did two years ago, mm -hmm. because no one wants to go back to work. That makes zero sense to me. They gotta, they gotta take the American if the couch sitters off the nipple and tell them to get back to work. Yeah. <laughs> and we also have to create uh, carrots, and there's plenty of carrots, especially in the roofing industry. Yeah. There's a lot of money to be made. And, and but manufacturers, same thing. I mean, all manufacturers have to do is just follow the Google standard. I, I teach this too to all the roofers uh, that listen to Roofing Business Builder. Put a ping pong table at your place, or put a uh, <laughs> absolutely you know, pool bring, table. Br pool, pool table. I have a pool table at my warehouse. People, customers play pool while they wait for their bid. Isn't that brilliant? Yeah. And then and then what you do too is dart boards or yeah, uh, I have a dart board as well on on Fridays. Uh, Cookouts. Call, call up one of the food trucks. Food trucks are looking for a location <laughs> yeah. to sell their food. You, you pay for it though, but how much is that going to cost you if you have like uh, 20 guys? Uh, say, well, let's just say, make it easy. It's less than 200 bucks probably, yeah. but you're helping a local business owner, small business owner, and you're you're. The people that work for you are going to be in love with you. They'll they'll be loyal. They're never going to jump ship to another a roofing company, even if they try to pay them an extra two dollars an hour. It's funny. I, I ordered a taco truck uh, last week. Are you serious? Yes. That's brilliant. Yes. Uh, so uh, basically, pick up a talk. It's taco and check Fridays. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> See, that's what creates. They're loyalty. like they're not going to come, and I'm like. They're coming for a check, and trust me, they'll come for tacos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and not just that. Um, employee of the month, uh, you know, it means really, a lot. it means a lot. You know, people sometimes, you know, they did a study whether somebody wanted uh, a bonus for pay or for time off, and people were shocked that they chose the time off. Uh, so sometimes people just want appreciation or they want a little time off. Doesn't mean they want more pay. Mm -hmm. So it's not always about money is, is the point. Yeah. And, and mine, uh, the mindset stuff that we, that I teach, you know, I teach higher levels of law of attraction too, yeah, but of course. the reason why we need a vacation, if you notice in Europe, if you work at, uh, in Germany, France, most places, uh, when you get hired in Europe, you're hired with six weeks vacation per year to start every person right out of high school. You always have six weeks vacation. And then the, it grows from there, but why? I even, I asked some, some German uh, people about this and they said, well, you have to get your mind off of what you're doing. When you come back, you're so refreshed, you have new ideas. Yeah. But in the esoteric world or the law of attraction world, what happens is if you keep looking at something, you're, that's all you have to look at. That's, that's your world right now. So you have no new inputs. So when you go on vacation, your mind sees different activities and then it changes. You, you now spark your creativity mm -hmm. and now your employees that you let go on vacation, when they come back, they're going to have a new way of looking at their work because they got different input. Not the same, you know, if you keep doing the same thing over and over, you're not going to change. There's nothing new. Yeah, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. But that vacation helps. It does help. Yeah, absolutely. People like vacations. And it's really, really important that you show appreciation and that you give them some time off. Um, yeah. It's really, really important. Yeah. Um, so, hey, Brian, so uh, what, what books would you suggest people to, to read? Uh, one particular book that really, really stands out to me is a book that I read. It was From Good to Great. And in one of the, you know, one of the underlying parts of that book that really stuck out to me uh, was they, they did a, uh, they kind of did a survey, okay? 
uh, the top organizations in the world. And what they did is they did it over a 10 year period of time. So they kind of eliminated luck, right? Over, you know, the kind of instability or stability of the economics, you know, economy. And what they did is they found that there was 10 or 11 companies that really stood out. And what they did is they, they tried to codify what, it, what is it that stood out? You know, what is it that they did differently? Mm -hmm. um, what is it that they went after or sought or thought or did that nobody else did? And what it was is what they had found is they hired intrinsically motivated people. They didn't spend their time on trying to hire just anyone and then try and motivate them because that's like spinning your wheels. You have to identify and learn to identify motivated people. You have to learn to find out where you're going to find these type of people. For instance, uh, a boxer, an MMA fighter, someone that just, they just want to win, right? They just want to win. They don't want to get in the ring and they want to win. And if you can find people like that, that were designed like that, you don't have to push them to learn. They want, they're self-seeking. They want to learn on their own. And they just will just ask you a million questions and they'll do it on their own. And you don't have to push them to that next level. And they're not doing it for you. They're doing it for them. And that's the biggest part. And how do you find them? One of the ways that we, we find motivated people other than just, you know, sources like a talk, like maybe a boxing gym. Okay. Um, but we use a program and it's, it's called outmatch.com, okay? And we put everybody through an assessment. So personally- Can I, can I ask you a question before we get into yeah. that? That was, uh, does it have something to do with the Myers-Briggs? Personality tests. It doesn't, it's, it, is, uh, it's just a gen it is an assessment um, and, it, and it goes through obviously all the different personality types and, but it's specific to the type of duty that are, duties that are required. Because in a sense, it doesn't matter, right? Because the, that test is pulling the exact person you're looking for then. Yes, it is. And what it does is actually, it says, okay, this is the person cl most closely related to what you're looking for. And then I interview them at that point. So what I do is I send out 100, 200 assessments to find the five or 10, 15 candidates that are actually fit for that position. Mm -hmm. And then, then I'll spend the time sitting down with those people because otherwise, I mean, my time is valuable. I don't have time to sit with 200 people, but I can assess 200 people. I can have someone sending out those assessments and when they get them back, if it shows that they are a good fit for the organization for that position, I bring them in and then I, if they're a good fit, I hire them. That works for one of our slogans at Thrifty Business Builder is more time off the roof, more time out of the office, more time on the yacht. Hire by science. Yeah. And that way in automate. So this is another uh, form of automation that right. they'll uh, totally give you some, give you your time back. A lot, most people listening to this program are looking for ways to get more time back. So you can yeah. spend more time with family, spend more time on That's vacation, you know, enjoy the, the money that they're making. Absolutely. I mean, the point of going into business is not to be a slave of your creation. It's, you're supposed to find freedom uh, within what you're doing. And I think the, you know, my goal in life is to teach people how to do that. It is. You're a great teacher too, Brian. Yeah. Well, here's another thing is Brian and I have known each other uh, for a long time. We did a, uh, a live stream earlier, but we did, we didn't <laughs> yeah. mention this on, on the podcast, but uh, you and I have been friends probably for how many years you think now? Uh, we've been friends since 2013. 2013. Yeah. So yeah, we're coming up on it's quite a journey. Yeah. And you know, I've learned a lot from, you know, Daniel, uh, very sharp guy. I helped you grow your business. He did. Yeah. He did. Um, you know, he, I don't know if I can mention the rep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I, rep. I, I owned a repping agency, yeah. uh, but, but what I later on well, realized is I was more of a business consultant than anything. I just yeah. made my money through the manufacturer's uh, products. Uh, but but we did. I, I came out. We did trainings for your employees. That's right. Uh, we did trainings for salespeople. Daniel was honestly he was a great help. Uh, he was always there, you know, for my reps when uh, you know when they needed him. He always picked up the phone. So absolutely wonderful resource. Uh, thank you. you. Know, can't, can't say anything bad about him. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> we covered a lot, didn't we? 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was great. I hope you really guys uh, enjoyed some of that content. Oh, they, no, they're going to enjoy all of it. They, these guys are, are real troopers. But, yeah. but hey, Brian, I just want to say, brother, Absolutely. thank you for being on the show. Absolutely. All right. I was glad to be here. So that was my interview with Brian McSteen. And wasn't that a great interview? We got a lot of good information. Even though Brian and I covered a lot of material and different subjects, it was great to hear the origin story of Brian's companies and how it started when he was a kid and he moved on up and then he carried that theme of expectations, being able to uh, translate your expectations to others, especially your employees, and then empower your employees to be able to uh, accomplish uh, these directives. But it was really good. And now it's time for Did, Did you, you know? know? Did you know that you could save a lot of time and a lot of money by having an internal communication system. This is uh, for your office staff or your techs on the roof. Now, if you're still using emails to communicate information, it's, which is smart because you're tracking the information. If someone says something, you need to have some proof that they said it. Uh, but the thing is, is you know, if you're using emails to communicate internal information to each other, well, you're paying a lot of money for people to delete all that spam. And that's just one area that you're saving money by using an internal communication system. Now, another way that you're going to use this internal communication system is that once you answer one of your employees' question, well, that question remains on the system. So as you hire new employees, you can use this as a training mechanism. They can Google a question that you answered one other employee last year or maybe five years ago, and they'll be able to find this information on their own while they're on that roof or while they're in the office and you are on your yacht. So take advantage of an internal communication system like Slack or Trello. There's plenty of ones out there. That is it for the show. Uh, but um, just also want to mention, if you haven't done so already, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, please click subscribe, maybe hit the bell. And so, you know, this show comes out either bi-monthly or sometimes I'll even put out an extra one. Uh, but be sure to hit the bell so that way when the next episode comes out, you'll be able to hear some uh, excellent information that's going to help you grow your business. And also, I'm op I I've got a few openings in my uh, calendar for a strategy call. So if you're looking at maybe utilizing the Roofing Business Builder program to grow your business into the multi-millions, to, to learn how to scale, to learn um, how to get more time back, then be sure to schedule a strategy call with me and we'll see if you're a good fit for the program. That's it for the show, guys. But I just want you to know that I truly appreciate uh, being on this journey with you as you're growing your roofing business into the multi-millions. So until next time, I don't always consult on commercial roofing, but when I do, I make millionaires. Stay wealthy, my friends.